In square four, you meet operational definitions. You defined handedness as a person's response to the question, are you left or right handed? And you defined intelligence as the score on a standard intelligence test. In square five, you pick a design. There are two parts to this, time and technique. The first choice is about time, immediate or long term. If you are interested in how variables change over time, you'll want to choose a longitudinal study. Longitudinal studies look at the long term. How does intelligence develop? What happens when people age? Or what are the long term effects of taking a drug? You study children as they grow, measuring them year after year. Remember having your parents measure how tall you've grown? Any long term issue can be studied longitudinally, but there's a cost. It's very expensive to conduct a longitudinal study. Subjects must be tracked, sessions scheduled, and tests re administered. All that takes time, energy, and money. In addition, files get lost, researchers lose interest, and subjects move away, refuse to participate, or die. Because of the difficulties and costs of conducting longitudinal studies, virtually all research is done once. If developmental issues are involved, the study takes a cross section of the population. Instead of testing the same children at different ages, a cross sectional study tests different ages at the same time. Instead of watching children grow, you select children of different ages and test them at the same point in time. The second choice is about technique. Since longitudinal studies are rare, it's not hard to choose a time frame. You will undoubtedly choose a current time single administration study. But there are lots of research techniques to choose from. The oldest technique in psychology was introspection. This wasn't the philosophical examination of your navel. Experimenters were trained to report the sensations they experienced. As stimuli were presented, they would describe in great detail the processes and reactions that were occurring. In the late 1800s, this was considered the state-of-the-art technique. The primary distinction is that subjects were trained in introspection. This was not average people expressing their reactions, but professional subjects, often other experimenters, who practiced selective disclosure. When a stimulus was presented, the trained introspectionist would report blue pinpoint of light glowing in left upper quadrant of the right visual field. They wouldn't just say, wow, pretty. Introspection isn't used anymore. It's been rejected as too subjective. The closest we come is the verbal protocol. Subjects talk as they think their way through problems and activities. Researchers use this to gather information to help them design experiments. It's useful for helping form testable hypotheses. If you're looking for an approach that is subjective, dated, but still used, you could follow Sigmund Freud's example by conducting a case study. Case studies are examples of real people whose names are changed to protect the innocent. Details of the case are given and a discussion is provided of how the theory at hand explains the matter. Essentially, case studies are used as illustrations of a theory. They are not a probative device. A version of a case study is taking an oral history. If you're looking for stories of the past or how people view the past, this might be a good choice for you. Another research technique is the survey. A survey can be quantitative, fill out a form, a structured interview, or both. The census is an official U.S. survey. Interviewers go door to door and forms are filled out. Businesses often use surveys to gather marketing and customer satisfaction information. If you would rather observe than interview, you can elect to do a field study, laboratory observation, or clinical observation. A field study is a naturalistic observation. Hiding in the woods to watch animals or sitting in a mall to watch shoppers are both naturalistic observations. Laboratory observation is less naturalistic, but has the benefit of being more controlled. You set up your lab and watch children at play, teens studying, or couples arguing. Some studies use one-way mirrors, but other researchers simply sit quietly in the corner of the room. Clinical observations can involve visiting the patient several times throughout the day, watching through a window, or monitoring on closed-circuit video. A focus group is a research technique that combines a survey and an observation. Although it can be as informal as friends sitting around a kitchen table discussing politics, a focus group is best at helping choose between options, the green one or the red one. In scholarly circles, the experiment is the king of research studies. It has the advantage of manipulating one variable and measuring another.